So we're excited to hear from our speaker today, Margarita Weissman from St. Andrews University. The title of Margarita's talk is A Brilliant Anomaly, Nadia Shadurova slash Alexander Alexandrov's Queer Autofiction. And after Margarita speaks, we'll hear from Sabsiednik Connor Dog from the University of Bristol. Margarita. Thank you very much, Anne, um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share the first slide of my presentation to see if it works properly. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be here today, joining colleagues and those interested in the Russian 19th century online on this great platform, 19V. It's a particular pleasure for me to talk to you today about Nadezhda Durova Alexandrov, a fascinating historical personality and prolific author whose life and texts I've been researching and teaching for the past few years. And I notice a lot of familiar names um, in the audience today, and I'm really flattered that quite a lot of Durova scholars um, are here today. So I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to an interesting discussion afterwards. Within Russia, Nadezhda Durova is well known, as far as historical figures go, unproblematically, as a cross-dressing cavalry maiden, a young noblewoman who in 1806 left her home in provincial Russia and served, disguised as a man, as a cavalry officer in the Russian army during the Napoleonic Wars. Outside of Russia, there's been in the last decade a sustained interest in Durova Alexandrov as one of the very few canonical genderqueer figures in Russian literary and cultural history who have left first-hand accounts of their lived experience. The difference between these two views or perceptions of Durova Alexandrov is exacerbated by the fact that in 2003, the Russian government passed a law, and I quote its title, against propaganda of homosexualism, lesbianism, bisexuality, and transgender, effectively banning any mention of non-heteronormative sexualities in public discourse. For those interested in the historical context and recent legacies of this law, it's terrifying to think that soon it would have been in place for almost a decade. I would recommend consulting Dan Healy's excellent book, Russian Homophobia from Stalin to Sochi, as well as a recent no less excellent cluster of Russian review articles, Illegal Queerness, Russian Culture and Society in the Age of Gay Propaganda Law, edited by Raman Utkin. But despite the cultural self-censorship, that's one of the troubling legacies of this law, it would be a mistake to think that Durova Alexandrov had been erased from Russian cultural history, and perhaps even more importantly for the audience of this talk, from Russian language academia. So the aim of my talk today is first to demonstrate the multiple convergences between the two approaches I outlined above, discuss briefly the institutional reasons behind their existence, and finally, to offer, through a close reading of Durova Alexandrov's texts, correspondence, and contextualizing historical sources, a new integrative framework through which we can approach Durova Alexandrov's work in the future, doing justice to their complex biography as a genderqueer person and perhaps even a trans man, at the same time making use of an immense treasure trove of archival material, such as military and medical records, private and business correspondence, as well as literary texts that have been uncovered and shared by the previous generations of scholars. Durova Alexandrov's rise to fame was propelled, to use their own words, by an interesting, brilliant, even great, but single anomaly of their life. The 10-year service in the Imperial Russian Army, under the name of first Alexander Sakalov, and then Alexander Alexandrov. In 1817, Durova Alexandrov retired from the army with the rank of Captain Lieutenant, Stabsrotmister, and settled in St. Petersburg. After four years in the capital, they moved back to Sarapul, a provincial town 630 miles east of Moscow, and then a year later to a nearby Labuga, to live close to their family. Inspired by their own interest in reading, Durova Alexandrov had been recording and revising their unusual experiences for many years in the form of a diary. This manuscript remained unpublished until 1835, when their brother, Vasily Durov, finally suggested that such an extraordinary life would make for a good story. Vasily had then approached his chance acquaintance, Alexander Pushkin, who was at that time, coincidentally, looking for submissions that would boost income from his new literary enterprise, the Sovremenik, or Contemporary Journal. The notes of the Cavalry Maiden, the most common English translation of this manuscript's multiple titles in Russian, did indeed come out in Sovremenik in 1836, with a preface written by Pushkin himself. 
A standalone book edition titled Cavalleries Divitsa, Preishestria of Russia, or Cavalry Maiden, The Russian Incident, followed the same year and was successful enough with readers to make Durova Alexandrov a welcome guest in St. Petersburg literary salons. As a famous author, known both as Nadezhda Durova, as you can see in the slide here from Savremenik, and under the pen name Alexandrov, they joined the ranks of the most prominent literary figures at the time. For example, in 1839, when the influential literary publisher Alexander Smirdin undertook to print a collection of works by the most famous Russian writers, Alexandrov's name was on the top of his list. Building on this success and in the hopes of supplementing their income with literary earnings, from 1838 to 1841, Durba Alexandrov published a number of novellas and short stories, most inspired by folk stories they knew from childhood and or came across their travels while in the military employ. You can see here the list of the most significant works, most published under the name Alexandrov. I'm sharing this list here on purpose, as quite often, obviously outside of the works of those who study Durov Alexandrov's um, life and work in detail, they're quite often seen and discussed as an author of just one text, the Notes of the Cavalry Maiden, which is by no means the case. Moreover, all of these texts were published soon after their completion, and some were expressly commissioned by leading journals. So they had quite a successful, if short, literary career. Most of Durova Alexandrov's literary texts feature an unusual first-person narrator who refers to themselves as female, indicated in the original Russian by the feminine endings of the verbs, adjectives, and other words, whereas other characters in both the notes of the Cavalry Maiden and later fiction address the protagonist as a man, indicated by pronouns and titles like sir or barin in the original Russian, which has a female equivalent of barinya or barishnya for younger unmarried women. This created a peculiar effect of inviting the reader into the narrator's confidence, sharing the secret of their concealed gender identity, a female one of Nadezhda Andreevna Durova. This narrative trick, thanks to which, as a scholar of cross-dressing narratives, Sherry Velasco puts it, mainstream audiences, it's a quote, could enjoy the disguise anticipating the pleasure of watching the diegetic characters reveal their true identity, end of quote. This trick was instrumental in shaping the image of Durova Alexandrov in the Russian cultural imagination that persists to this day. Although it might seem surprising to those outside of Russia, Nadezhda Durova, and I call this person Durova here on purpose, is an established presence in Russian popular culture and even political propaganda. Durova's face graces the two ruble 2012 commemorative coin, that commemorates the Great Patriotic War of 1812, for example. You can see here it's in the series of um, generals and heroes of the Great Patriotic War. There are two thriving state-maintained museums, one in the town of Durov's childhood, Sarapul, and one in the town where she lived in retirement and died, Yelabuga. There are also a few state and community-funded monuments, some of which you can see on this slide. Um, that's not the extent of it, there is more. Um, and these are dotted around these two towns. In a less formal way, Durva's fame lives on even in the branded sweets produced by local chocolate factories. Similarly, prominent patriotic image is projected onto the international audiences too. And some of you might be familiar with this website. It's kind of Western facing Russian cultural Wikipedia. And you can see the company that Durva, notice Durva, not Durva Alexandrov, keeps here with other prominent Russians, um, most of whom I think require no introduction. Although most of Durov Alexandrov's literary texts have not been republished this side of 1917, the notes of Cavalry Maiden have never, to my knowledge, been out of print. There are numerous contemporary editions, and you might notice that they all have different titles. It's one other thing that we can discuss later, perhaps. There is a long and illustrious bibliography of the same text, the Knights of the Cavalry Maiden, published in Soviet times. Different editions have um, different, um, differently arranged chapters, but that's also a talk for another time. And there is also an almost equally long list of Soviet adaptations, children's books, plays, operas, but I would like to highlight one of them in particular because of its cultural significance. significance. Some connoisseurs of Russian popular culture might recognize the figure in this picture, 
a character from one of the most popular subgenres of Russian urban folklore jokes or anecdote about Parucci or Cornet Rzhevsky. Here he is in the signature flirting pose in a still from a 1962 Soviet musical, The Hussar Ballad. Parucci's popularity as a character featuring in Russian urban folklore is perhaps a testament to the skill of Eldar Rizanov, the film's director and script editor, who was the producer of a number of iconic Soviet comedies. Rzhevsky is, however, only a supporting character in the film that actually focuses on the story of Shurochka Azarova, a young noblewoman who, motivated by her love for the motherland, joins the Imperial Russian army during the Great Patriotic War of 1812 to fight with Napoleon. Shurochka Azarova, the musical's main character, whose story was loosely based on Durov Alexandrov's adventures, first tries on a hussar's uniform for a masquerade ball held at her uncle's estate. She then joins the army to follow the handsome officer, Rzhevsky. Conversing in rhyming couplets, together they fight against Napoleon's cowardly troops. Transformed into a cross-dressing love story, which is itself a very well-established genre, and of course masquerade here is key, to this um, genre in the plot. The film itself glosses over many issues of gender normativity raised by Durov Alexandrov's original text. Rizanov's film was in its turn an adaptation of an incredibly popular Soviet theatre play by Alexander Gladkov, Davnim Davno, or A Long Time Ago, published in 1940. The play's initial radio performances were broadcast in 1941 over the public radio service, interspersed with the news bulletins from the battlefield. Its popularity was such that finally one of its productions was awarded a Stalin Prize in 1942. Thanks in no small degree to Rizanov's film, which is still popular today, Nadezhda Durova remains a constant presence in Russian cultural imagination as a cross-dressing military hero of the Napoleonic Wars and an all-around good patriot. This legendary and unproblematic status is reflected in the disciplinary traditions in which most contemporary Russian academic studies of Durova's life and work have been produced in the last two decades. These studies fall generally into two categories, military history and studies of local history and culture, and are often funded, if not always, by the Russian state research grants. You can see the two major studies of this kind on the slide here. These studies, of course, like any study, have some limitations, most notably in their theoretical groundings, in gender, queer and trans theory, most noticeably, but they're also indispensable for any scholar. Ala Bigunova, for example, uncovered and published a number of military records from the archives which have never been seen before. Some of these I'll share with you today, thanks to that scholar's wonderful discoveries. These are by no means the only recent studies of Durova in Russian, but I'd like to avoid turning this into a bibliography session as much as I can get excited about it myself. I'm sharing these to demonstrate the breadth and depth of Durova studies in contemporary Russia, where feminist readings of Durova's text through Judith Butler's theory of performativity are also very popular and can be found in Russian language articles and a number of recently defended PhD dissertations. And in Prikashkova's books, for example, um, there are collated bibliographies of recent research in Russian, German and English, so it's very much a thriving field. But to return to the argument I'm making today about the convergences between different disciplinary readings, when we take a closer look at the original documents, partly previously available, partly uncovered by the scholars of Nadezhda Durova, a more complicated picture of Durova Alexandrov's gender identity comes into view. Aside from Durov Alexandrov's literary texts, which are well studied, uh, we have two other types of sources that can help us on our way to develop a new, inclusive and historically informed framework to discuss and study their life and work. The first type of sources are texts composed by Durov Alexandrov for non-literary purposes, primarily their business correspondence with their editors, most often discussed and well known as Durov Alexandrov's correspondence with Pushkin, but there is also a cache of their letters to Andrei Krajewski, editor and publisher of the journal Atechstuny Zapiski, or Notes of the Fatherland, which was first discovered and published in 1983. It includes also official correspondence with Russian government agencies and the army, for example, letters to Barclay de Tolly. Another source of this type is Durov Alexandrov's short autobiography, After Biographia, composed at a publisher's request sometime in the 1840s. The second type of sources are testimonials, memoirs, and mentions of Durova Alexandrov left by their contemporaries. Most of these texts have been widely available since the end of the 19th century, 
Thought of Alexandrov's status as a veritable celebrity meant that the texts of this kind were published in some of the most popular historical periodicals in the Russian Empire, like Istarichiski Vesnik, so the Historical Herald, or Ruska Estarina, so Russian history or olden days. These journals have been digitized and are now also available online. The local museums are also working diligently on capturing and publicizing more sources of this kind as they appear. My interest in both types of these sources is twofold. On the one hand, they tell a fascinating story of a lived experience of gender nonconformity in the first half of the 19th century in Russia. On the other, these sources themselves have also acquired their own interpretational history in both English and Russian, which, and this is something I'm going to demonstrate today, can actually be counterproductive if our ambition as scholars is to do justice to Durov Alexandrov's life as well as their literary work. It's tempting to discard the findings and analysis offered in studies that either ignore Durov Alexandrov's ambiguous gender identity or misgender them altogether. However, my contention is that these readings are not coming out of a conscious desire to rewrite the story of Durov Alexandrov's past to make it more heteronormative, but rather are examples of what we would call, in a term that would be very familiar to scholars of 18th century literary cultures, a kind of a naive reading, an interpretation of a fictional or fictionalized narrative where the reader identifies the figure of the first person narrator with the figure of the author. <laughs> These readings are exceptionally common when the authors are celebrities in their own right. A well-known example in Russian literary history are Nikolai Karamzin's Letters of the Russian Traveller, Pismo Ruskovo Putyashestvenika, a carefully calibrated, multi-layered, self-conscious travel narrative, which was nonetheless read by many contemporaries as actual letters from one Nikolai Karamzin to his friends. My findings show a clear divide in terms of gender between the narrators of Durov Alexandrov's literary texts and I of their correspondence and other non-literary writings or ego documents to borrow a term from the studies of life writing. The narrator of literary text is not ambiguously gendered. She is for the most part female, quite possibly often called Nadezhda Durova, a young woman who successfully passes for a man. Alexander Sakhalov at first and later Alexandrov. Feminine endings of verbs, adjectives, and participles in references by the narrator to herself and masculine endings and addresses sir by others sustain this binary throughout. Susan Lancer, in her notes on the emerging theory of transnarratology, refers to this type of narrative as a story of circumstantial passing rather than an embodied transidentity. This female narrator appears first in the notes of the cavalry maiden and reappears throughout Durov Alexandrov's later work. Many of their shorter texts have a narrative frame indicating that they share the narrator, a woman disguised as a man, with the notes. It's this fictional truth, to borrow Michael Rufato's term, so brilliantly brought to life by the author, that allows for productive readings of their texts that do not focus on Durov Alexandrov's transmasculinity, but are far from naive in terms of what they have to say about gender politics, gendered narration, and literary history in 19th century Russia. I'm referring here, of course, to a number of landmark studies of Durova Alexandrov's work um, that have contributed significantly to our knowledge of Durova's um, life and work in both English and Russian. In fact, before my, I myself had access to what I call contextualizing sources alongside Durova Alexandrov's literary texts, I have also approached their story as one of a woman writer successfully subverting contemporary gender norms through cross-dressing in a manner of, say, Georges Sand a few decades later. It's a well-known fact that the notes of the cavalry maiden is not a straightforward autobiography. A number of studies have meticulously collated multiple discrepancies between Durova Alexandrov's by now well-documented biography and this fictionalized narrative. The main differences between uh, the main differences concern their age. Durova Alexandrov has shaved five years off their age and consistently gave an incorrect date of birth after the publication and their marital status. By the time Durov Alexandrov joined the army in 1806, they have been married and had a son with a local civil servant, Chernov. I would argue that there is another, perhaps previously unnoticed, but very important discrepancy here. All contextual sources suggest that Durov Alexandrov's perception of their own identity in life, as opposed to literary narratives, was male. In deference to that, I will, while discussing these sources, refer to Alexandrov using masculine pronouns as he did himself. 
Chronologically, the first evidence that we have of this sustained masculine identity is Alexandrov's correspondence with Alexander Pushkin. As I have mentioned before, the suggestion to publish the manuscript of the notes came from Alexandrov's brother, Vasily Durov, who had a passing acquaintance with Pushkin. Vasily Durov's original letter to the poet has not survived, but Pushkin's reply, as well as his ensuing direct correspondence with Alexandrov, forms a corpus of 11 letters sent over the period of 16 months in 1835 and 1836. These letters are available, published and by now digitized multiple times alongside Pushkin's other correspondence, and are often republished in editions of the Notes of the Cavalry Maiden, forming a kind of a cliched paratext to Alexandrov's literary writings. After Alexandrov was discharged from the army, he continued to wear male clothes and lived under the name Alexandrov until the end of his life. Public records, including the military pension accounts, like the one you can see here, and record of death, all testify that Alexandrov was his legal name of choice ever since he received an official permission to use it from the highest authority in Russia, Emperor Alexander I. It was not unusual for noblemen in Russia at the time to petition the emperor directly for money or to resolve long-standing legal disputes, and this privilege was not reserved for those at court. As described in the cavalry maiden and corroborated by correspondence and military records, in 1808, Alexandrov had a private audience with a Tsar, who, intrigued by his unusual story, granted Alexandrov permission to use his cavalry name and promised financial support. That's not to say that there were no snags in the machine of Russian military administration. Some of the documents revealed by Bigunova show the extent of bureaucratic confusion produced by Durova's legal transition to Alexandrov. For example, their request for a copy of their army dismissal record was refused for the following reason. A new report needs to be commissioned, says the Russian on the slide, to see if we can indeed supply this record because the applicant is not of male but of female gender and is perhaps in a possession of a husband. Still, using the hard-won male name in everyday life and in print meant a lot to Alexandrov, but it was at odds with Pushkin's marketing strategy for his manuscript. In his letters, Pushkin repeatedly emphasized that as a publisher, he believed that the success of this manuscript directly depended on the curious, and that's Pushkin's word, mismatch between the author's private and public gender identities and the interplay between the two in the narrative. Pushkin's initial response to Vasily Durov, dated 16th of June 1835, indicates that the poet turned publisher was ready to accept Durov Alexandrov's manuscript, Sight Unseen, based solely on their already significant scandalous fame. The life of the author is so curious, wrote Pushkin, so well known and so mysterious that the reveal of his secret would make a strong general impression. After Vasily initiated the correspondence and once the publisher's interest was secured, Alexander wrote to Pushkin directly to discuss editorial matters and Vasily stepped in to discuss finances when needed. Alexandrov's letters to Pushkin have been thoroughly analyzed, but the grammar of Alexandrov's responses often goes unnoticed. For example, the first letter from Alexandrov in August 1835 informed Pushkin that the author indeed was happy to sell their unpublished manuscript and that Pushkin could edit it as much as he needed to preparing for publication. Throughout the letter, Alexandrov used masculine verb endings and signed the letter with a customary formula, your devoted servant, Priyadani. Sluga Alexandra, using a masculine ending for the adjective and signing off with his male name. Alexandra's next letter from September 1835, updating Pushkin about postal delays with the manuscript, was similarly signed Alexander Alexandrov and listed a postal address Alexandrov at Yelabuga, which indicates that this name was used for residency records and legal correspondence. This letter also includes a portrait of Alexandrov made, as he wrote, when I was 16 years old, and it looks and reflects, obviously, the way it was necessary for me to look then. This portrait seems to have been lost, but there is another image that is sometimes reprinted in editions of the notes, which might give us an idea of the kind of portrait that Alexandrov could be discussing here. As you can see from that passage, there is no pretense or hiding the change of their gender identity. But the way Alexander referred to the change here suggests that he was forced to look like a woman earlier, whereas now, when he's free to choose how to present himself to the world, he chooses to be seen as Alexandrov. Pushkin largely goes along with it, as long as it doesn't compromise the commercial success of his publication. 
and this is where the disagreement occurs. Throughout the letters, Pushkin addresses his correspondent as Alexandrov and uses male pronouns and adjectival endings throughout. In his initial reply to Vasily's letter, Pushkin refers to the author of the notes as male throughout as well. Although author, after, has until very recently been used in Russian to refer to authors of any gender, the pronouns used in this letter are also masculine. For example, when discussing the honoraria, Pushkin says, if he, on, decides to sell his manuscript while it's still unpublished, let him define the price himself. In his replies from January 1836, still discussing the manuscript's postal adventures, Pushkin addresses his correspondent as Dear Sir, Milistivy Gusudar Alexander Andreevich, continuing with his previous male form of address. Most interestingly, when Pushkin writes to Vasily Durov in March 1836 to negotiate payment, he refers to Alexandrov as Vasily's brother. Pushkin is, however, fully aware of the complications of Durov Alexandrov's gender identity. As towards at the end of the letter, his tone changes and the brother turns into little brother, Bratitz. At the end of the letter, Pushkin adds, farewell, be happy, and may God let you become richer with the help of Alexandrov's lucky little hand, which little hand I entrust you to kiss on my behalf. Obviously, an ironic allusion to the brother's gender ambiguity. However, when referring to this manuscript in discussion with others, Pushkin would invariably call it Durova's Notes, Zapiski Durovi, and this was how the text finally appeared in print, prefaced by the publisher's introduction, highlighting the mystery of the author's gender identity. Alexander Fintan was horrified by the prospect of seeing the name Durova in print, and those of you who know a little about Durova would be familiar with various readings of these passages. In a letter from June 1836, he implored Pushkin to do everything possible to make sure the manuscript was published under the name Alexander. He talks about his anguish about seeing the name Durova in print in the introduction and asks if there is any way of avoiding this misfortune. Generally reserved and down to earth in his correspondence with his famous publisher, here Alexandrov mentions that he shivers from being called by this name and once again signs off as Alexandrov. The solution he offers would place the author in between genders. Personal notes of a Russian Amazon known under the name Alexandrov. Pushkin's reply is brisk and businesslike. The copies are published and his advice is to leave the names as they are. Pushkin's arguments are stylistic. Notes by N. A. Durova, he says, sounds better than notes of an Amazon. And Pushkin encourages the author to be, and I quote, brave and enter the literary profession with the same courage with which you've entered the profession that has brought you fame. In another letter from June, Alexandrov admonishes Pushkin for delays in printing and distributing his manuscript, and in the end refers again to his military past as an excuse for directness. Remember, writes he, I was born, grew up, and became a man in a military camp, all through with masculine endings of verbs and a clear emphasis on masculine gender identity. Pushkin writes back, calling the letter sweet, Mila, since it shows, he writes, fiery and impatient temper. When a part of Alexandrov's manuscript appeared a year later in Savrimenik under the title Notes by N. A. Durova, published by A. Pushkin, Pushkin added to it an epigraph, modo vir, modo femina, now a man, now a woman, from Ovid, but Pushkin also used it earlier for his poem, his own poem, House and Columna and a short publisher's note. It briefly recounted the author's success in keeping their female identity secret for the duration of the military service. In 1808, writes Pushkin, a young boy by the name of Alexandrov enlisted as a private, distinguished himself, was awarded a soldier's cross of St. George for bravery, and that same year was promoted to officer with the Mariupol Hussars Regiment and continued to serve as zealously as when he first joined. This, Pushkin noted further, was a fairly ordinary military career. However, at a certain point, it has created a stir, and this is a quote from Pushkin, provoked a lot of gossip and have made a big impression on the public because, one of, one of, because of one circumstance that became known accidentally. Cornet Alexandrov was a maid, Nadezhda Durova. Finally, Zavremenik was able to offer its readers a first-hand account of these extraordinary events. Now, writes Pushkin, Durova herself is resolving the secret. Honored by her trust, we will be publishing her curious notes. It's with utmost sympathy that we have read confessions of a woman so unusual, 
It's with wonder that we have seen her tender fingers, which have once clutched the bloody hilt of a sabre, also guiding a fast, picturesque and fiery pen. Pushkin's preface clearly shows that by the time an extract from the notes of the cavalry maiden was first published in Savremeni, Durva Alexandrov was already a celebrity, famous for leading a life that transgressed the established boundaries between genders. Here, the dual nature of Durva Alexandrov's public representation, cavalry officer, cavalierist as male, and maiden, divitsa, as female, to, again, to use Sherry Velasco's up definition, created a transgender spectacle that provoked a crowd-pleasing shock effect. The slightly eroticized language of Pushkin's description of Durova's nimble fingers and their ability to grasp both a pen and a saber underscored the erotic undertones typically associated with narratives of female cross-dressing. If the correspondence we've briefly examined demonstrates very clearly that Alexandrov's chosen gender identity was male, Pushkin's foreword, by contrast, explains also why Alexandrov never abandoned, but instead carefully maintained his female narrator in most of the later texts, clearly for commercial, or as we would say now, marketing purposes. Some of these later texts would be published in Atechistine Zapiski, and the same duality will be preserved. In correspondence between Alexandrov and the journal's editor, Andrei Krajewski, we find no signatures other than Alexandrov and no pronouns other than masculine. Operating daily within this binary between a female protagonist of best-selling books and a public persona presenting as male could not have been easy. In Durov Alexandrov's own view, their gender identity became a brilliant anomaly that on the one hand produced their fame and success and on the other was a source of trouble. For example, in their 1838 autobiographic novella, A Year in St. Petersburg or The Trouble with Third Visits, they reflect on the difficulties of navigating the social life in St. Petersburg high society after the success of the Notes of the Cavalry Maiden. Everyone wants to meet the famous dashing cavalry maiden, but when a 50-something old Durova Alexandrov shows up, in civil clothes, refusing to dance, play cards, or to share amusing anecdotes about their life, the good people of St. Petersburg are inevitably disappointed and never invite them again. Although grammatically the narrator in this piece remains female throughout, the introspective character of its analysis of gender ambiguity suggests that this text occupies a kind of a middle, perhaps even transitionary, ground between Durov Alexandrov's female narrator in literary fiction and their biographical voice that we can hear in other sources, such as in correspondence or autobiographical notes. In a key scene in this novella, Durova Alexandrov describes a visit from Pushkin to their temporary lodgings in St. Petersburg. In this scene, the protagonist's gender ambiguity reaches its height. A female narrator tells us a story of how someone, Pushkin in this case, cannot make sense of them referring to themselves as a man. I'm not going to repeat the praises with which the polite writer and poet has showered the style of my notes. As I suspect, in this case, he used the expressions that educated people usually use to address ladies. However, my courteous guest was visibly disconcerted every time I, mentioning anything about myself, said, Gavarila, was, will, arrived, пришел, went, пошел, saw, увидел. My long-time habit of using year instead of an a, so that means the masculine endings instead of feminine endings, meant that I was very much used to this change. I continued, продолжала, to talk in no way obstructed by my role that has by now become natural for me. Finally, Pushkin brought both his visit and our conversation to an end, as it was becoming increasingly difficult for him to continue. At the end of their meeting, Pushkin, following the contemporary etiquette, also kissed the protagonist's hand, something he would do only to a woman. This, as the text testifies, provoked much embarrassment on Durov Alexandrov's part. The protagonist blushed, snatched away their hand, and informed Pushkin that they were not used to such behavior anymore. Durov Alexandrov has a chance to, perhaps inadvertently, embarrass their patron in turn when they attend a dinner at his apartment. There, the protagonist reports, it was Pushkin who turned red in the face when, in response to his teasing, his youngest daughter refused to consider Durov Alexandrov as a potential husband. However, as soon as Durov Alexandrov steps out of boundaries of literary narratives, the ambiguity of gender representation disappears, giving space without fail to a masculine public persona. <laughs> 
Durava Alexandrov's short autobiography, compiled at a publisher's request, is an illuminating example of just such a source. It's an informal curriculum vitae from birth to the time of its writing. It lists major events of Durava Alexandrov's life in chronological order, accompanied by very personal notes on particularly important events. Similarly to correspondence, autobiography uses exclusively masculine pronouns and verb endings from noting Alexandrov's birth, I was born, Radilsa, in 1788, to describing their present location and circumstances. In 1841, I said farewell, Prastilsa, to Petersburg forever. This text follows the cavalry maiden in maintaining the edits Durova Alexandrov had already made to their life story, giving an incorrect date of birth and omitting any mention of marriage and motherhood. Complementing the account, often in a year, a year of life in St. Petersburg, after biographia recounts amusing anecdotes about life in the capital, but also highlights the discomfort produced by Durova Alexandrov's public performance of non-binary gender identity. After a few years in St. Petersburg, they moved to live with an aunt in Malarosia, present-day Ukraine, who, although telling her guest off for getting too suntan like a simple peasant, Muzik Prastoy, instead of a young nobleman, Panich, has clearly, at least according to this summary, made peace with the relative's presentation as a man. So have, it seems, Durov Alexandrov's other contemporaries. On the one hand, Pushkin's letters and also popular poet Denis Davidov's dismissive account of his own acquaintance with the cavalry maiden are often included in republications of Durova's texts, and as I've mentioned, have by now become their almost cliched paratext. On the other hand, testimonials and recollections by Durova Alexandrov's contemporaries, although well known to biographers, rarely feature in academic or public discussions of Durova Alexandrov's life and work, and yet they're extremely revealing. The two accounts I would briefly discuss today have been collated at the end of the 19th century by Yelabuga residents, who have gathered testimonies, and I quote one of those articles, by eyewitnesses who still live in Yelabuga, sorry, 1890s, and have known Durova very well. The first account by Lashmanov was published in 1890 in Ruska Estrena, a historical monthly that was published from 1870 to 1918. Lashmanov testified to retired Stab Rotmister's preference for the name Alexandrov, discussed Alexandrov's preferred style of clothing, an officer's jacket, and noted that misgendering was a sure way to invite Alexandrov's ire. Throughout the sketch, Lashmanov used the names Durova and Alexandrov, as well as gendered pronouns, interchangeably, and at the end of the article reminded his readers about Durova Alexandrov's dying wish. Before the end of her life, Nadezhda Andreevna Durova asked Prasila to be buried under the name of Alexandrov, but the priest didn't think it was possible to honor the dying man's wish. And so in this way, the name Alexander Andreevich Alexandrov had disappeared along with the man who carried it honestly and sacredly until the very last moments of his life. Another account by Kutcher appeared in Vestnik in 1894, following an earlier biographical sketch. Kutcher also noted that she was always dressed in male attire, has always behaved as a man, and didn't like it when people addressed her as they would address a woman, would get angry and would sharply tell them off. Interestingly, the title of Kutcher's article, Durov Alexandrov, a historical sketch, is often misquoted. Durov's biographers Bigunov and Plikashko, for example, both misquote the title of Kutcher's article as Durova Alexandrov or Nadezhda Durova Alexandrova, whereas Kutcher specifically explained his rationale for using Durova Alexandrov's male name. In conclusion, I have to say that the title of my article has been chosen with some consideration. Durova has always considered herself, Shitala Sibya, to be a man, wore a man's clothes, tried to imitate men in her manners, voice and gait, and didn't allow to address her in any other way, especially since Emperor Alexander I ordered her to be called Alexandrov. So let her be known among future generations as she wished under the surname Durov Alexandrov. Later on, Kutcher would also publish an account of the opening of a monument to Durov Alexandrov in 1901, in which he continued to use masculine endings. There is a number of testimonials of this kind, and I will not have the time today to share all of them with you. But this kind of sensitive statement made in 1890s should make us think twice when we talk about 19th century sensitivity and openness to non-heteronormative identities as ahead of its time. <laughs>
But the question I'm asking and hopefully answering here today is what do they tell us about Nadezhda Durova and Alexandra Alexandra? Narratology, a study of narrative structures and how they affect our perception of culture, has a term for the kind of device or genre or style that Durova Alexandrov seems to be employing in their literary texts, autofiction. Autofiction is a genre of autobiographical writing in which the protagonist, often also a first person narrator, shares the name and often the full name, including surname, with the author. The protagonist usually shares the events of the author's biography, although the same events can result in different outcomes for the protagonist and the author. The protagonist's age and sometimes gender can also be different to the author's. Autofiction often has a traumatic event propelling the plot, often focuses on vulnerable subjects, and recent scholarship refers to this as a dominant storytelling mode for queer authors. Autofiction has reached popularity recently because it perfectly reflects the fragmented narratives of self that are created in the era of selfies, blogs, and Instagram stories, which offer an augmented reality, sometimes for commercial, sometimes for artistic purposes, of an individual's life. Although the flourishing contemporary practice of this type of fiction produced an explosion of critical examination and creative coaching, the history of the genre is less commonly explored. However, it builds on similar investigations of connected phenomena of autobiographical prose, like autodocumentary texts, memoirs, and contemporary multimedia narratives of the digital self, all productively explored in Slavic studies, some in relation to Durov Alexandrov themselves. I suggest this stem to characterize the literary work, as I think it helps us to distinguish between the two different biographical subjects. Nadezhda Durova, a protagonist of a number of literary texts, including the Notes of the Cavalry Maiden, and Alexander Alexandrov, the author of these texts. Nadezhda Durova seems to have never really even existed as an author. If one were to argue that we need to stick with legal historical rather than assigned names when discussing historical figures, then they could be swiftly reminded that Durov Alexandrov's legal name was Nadezhda Chernova after their husband. So why do we need this distinction? Firstly, because it restores historical facts of Alexandrov's life, which have for years been obscured by a powerful myth of Nadezhda Durova, partly created by Alexandrov himself. Secondly, because it exposes and problematizes an obvious scholarly bias. Although attentive and interested in contemporary genderqueer and trans narratives, we, and I include myself in this we as well, often unconsciously project our understanding of conservative values onto the past epochs, overlooking or dequeering such narratives if they belong to the past. When presenting my work, on Durova Alexandrov, I often have to answer questions about the so-called queer lens that ask, would their contemporaries have perceived their gender identity the same as we do? Well, my research into Durova Alexandrov's correspondence, autobiographical narratives, and what I call contextualizing sources, memoirs, testimonials, ephemera, shows without a doubt that although people in Yelaboga, Sarapul, and St. Petersburg would obviously not have used terms like non-binary, genderqueer, or trans, they were perfectly capable of describing and honoring Durov Alexandrov's choice of gender presentation, and moreover, articulating their respect and understanding the difficulties of this choice and the resulting commitments. Thirdly, and finally, because positioning Durov Alexandrov in the interdisciplinary context of queer and transcultural history allows us, scholars of Russian 19V, to take advantage of the very useful methods of research these fields have developed. Historians of queer culture globally investigate the lives of their subjects, aiming to reconstruct and analyze their lived and literary mediated experience without imposing anachronistic readings onto their narratives. The approach that I suggest in today's talk draws on this rich body of work and aims to employ, to quote Jack Halberstam, methodologies that are sensitive to historical change, but are influenced by current theoretical preoccupations. Coming to it late, as we do at this stage, would allow us hopefully also to avoid its pitfalls and foster not just inclusive scholarly investigations, but also an inclusive academic environment, something, as the recent well-known lists of troubles suggest, we're still a long way away from. Distinguishing between Durova Alexandrov literary and lived identities allows us to reject patri patriotic dequeering of historical figures, analyze the narrative mechanisms behind their autofictional literary creations, and consider their implications for Russian literary history. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to respond today.
Uh, I'm really pleased to be part of 19V, which I think has been a great initiative for rethinking 19th century Russian literature. Uh, 19V is becoming a home for new approaches and innovative methodologies in 19th century studies, and Margarita's paper is a fine example of work that pushes the boundaries uh, in this way. Dorova Alexandrov, as I have learned to call them uh, in the course of Margarita's presentation, is no stranger to Russianists. And as Margarita eloquently shows, there is a substantial scholarly literature already in both English and Russian. Yet that scholarly literature has not always problematized gender as thoroughly as one might like. The rise of queer theory in the 1990s and the more recent emergence of trans studies provide new prisms through which Durova Alexandrov's work might be explored and fresh critical questions emerge. Margarita's paper today has begun to pose and answer some of these questions. The paper challenges us to think beyond the familiar story of Durova as, quote, the cross-dressing cavalry maiden that I think is too often taken as a decisive statement about the writer's identity. And uh, instead of that, Margarita uh, proposes that we look at ways in which uh, Durova Alexandrov does gender uh, both uh, as a historical subject and through uh, the creation of uh, ego texts and autobiographical literature. Margarita speaks to about the de-queering of Durova Alexandrov that uh, has taken place in Russia over the centuries. We are familiar, of course, with attempts to suppress the queer sexuality of historical figures, the erasure of references to homosexuality in Victorian editions of the Greek texts, for example, or more recently, the debates around Tchaikovsky and the refusal in some quarters to acknowledge his homosexuality and the impact that that might have had uh, on his work. But Durova Alexandrov, in many ways, uh, is a more interesting example precisely because their gender crossing is so central to the individual story, it cannot be ignored or suppressed in the same way. I'm intrigued to know then what is it about Durova Alexandrov? that has allowed them to escape this kind of censure. Is Durova Alexandrov an example of what Raywin Connell, uh, the leading theorist of masculinity calls, quote, an honorary man, one who has fulfilled enough of the criteria of hegemonic masculinity to benefit from the patriarchal dividend, not only in his own time, but through the centuries. Does Durova Alexandrova's continued popularity, especially the success of Zapiski Cavalieristi Vitsi, rest on their service in the military to the Russian Empire? What strategies, moreover, are used by those who curate the legacy of Durova Alexandrova in order to de queer their subject? I'm also really interested in the way Margarita's paper begins to articulate the difference between a historical Alexandrov, who refers to himself with male pronouns, masculine grammatical endings on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, a fictional self who uses uh, female pronouns and narrates the history of how she was able to take on uh, a male role within society. Uh, Pushkin seems to have played a key role here. Uh, it's interesting to see how he encouraged Durova Alexandrov to uh, narrate the story as kind of woman become man rather than a man story. What does this say about the broader gender order of the time? What does it say about Pushkin's assumptions? It seemed that he surmised that this kind of story with the name Durova on the cover would have a somewhat salacious appeal, a fascination to audiences uh, of the time. One wonders whether Durova Alexandra felt it desirable or even necessary to present this figure uh, uh, in a, a literary narrative 
in order to appeal to a particular audience, uh, even as the historical Alexandrov was uh, willing to use, uh, keen to use uh, male pronouns and masculine endings in his everyday life. Finally, I wonder what broader lessons we might uh, draw out of Margarita's paper. Uh, at the end of the paper, she speaks uh, about uh, the rise of ego texts in the context of uh, social media, blog writing today, uh, the fluidity uh, of identity and gender and sexuality that has come to, to characterize uh, the 21st century. And I wonder how, uh, we might use that to open up the 19th century beyond Durava and how also we might harness uh, the, the, the multiple selves, the multiple doings of gender in Durava to speak to our own time. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Um, uh, and thank you again to our speaker. So I think we will now, well, first of all, Margarita might want to address some of Connor's points and after that, we'll open up the floor for questions and Sasha will be moderating the chat. But Margarita, maybe you want to um, respond. Thank you very briefly, because I've already had the stage for 45 minutes. Um, I think there's one thing that um, might be a kind of an answer to multiple questions that must multiple questions that Connor posed there. Um, and I think my reply to the suggestion that has Dora Alexander become an honorary man would be kind of the opposite. They have very obviously become an honorary woman, right? The kind of a patriotic woman who is happy to submit their in their narrative, right, as it is perceived in contemporary Russia. Someone who's happy to um, sacrifice their womanhood because of their love patriotic love for the motherland, which of course is not the case if you read Zapiski, but is pretty much the case if the only things you know about Durova are how she's portrayed. They are portrayed in, um, in, in Gusarska Balada. And that kind of goes towards those strategies, the curating strategies that the museums employ. Um, so Alexandrov as a name is very rarely mentioned in the, um, in the museum surroundings. Um, and it's very much a story of Nadezhda Durova as told specifically in uh, Zapiski Kavaliris Divice. What I found surprising when I was doing my own research, and I think I've mentioned that none of the documents that I've shown you today, aside from Ala Bigunova's wonderful discoveries, are bibliographic rarities, right? So Ruska Stalina has been widely available since the end of the 19th century. So these testimonies from people who knew Durov Alexandrov and very obviously talk about how they lived their everyday life, very much um, presenting as a man, have always been there. It's just there is no scholarly habit of looking at them alongside Durov Alexandrov's literary narratives. And as I've said, I think it testifies to how good these literary narratives are. They're very persuasive. So it seems to me that Durov Alexandrov has put together, or Alexandrov has written this narrative in which half of the problems that he himself experienced in everyday life, as we can see them in one year of life in St. Petersburg, just didn't exist because for Nadezhda Durov, the literary character, everything's very straightforward. Well, most of the time. So I think that kind of ties in together the curatorial strategies and um, the kind of partly explains the kind of status that Durov Alexandrov has in contemporary Russia. Great, so it looks like we have a question from Ilya. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Margarita and, and Connor. Margarita, this was really uh, fascinating uh, to hear. I, uh, I have a kind of maybe overly specific question, but maybe it kind of opens up. Um, uh, uh, into into broader uh, issues, which is uh, I was really intrigued by how um, you know Pushkin sort of plays along uh, when during the correspondence, right? And and you know is okay with this sort of you know pronoun uh, um, you know sort of going along with with Alexandrov's um, uh, use of pronouns, and then. Um, Kind of in in the personal encounter, uh, as reported, right? Something breaks down, and I'm wondering, and and the game can no longer go on for some reason, right? And I'm wondering, um, you know, if 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 what makes it easier to play along initially is 
if I understand correctly, is a kind of uh, practice of mystification that Pushkin himself was uh, was quite uh, uh, quite adept at, and the kind of whole romantic tradition where he thought, oh, okay, let's play this game, right? And then, um, but then at a certain point, and I'm just always curious at what point that is, um, it becomes too uncomfortable, right? It's just, um, you know, the game <laughs> needs to end at some point for him, right? And, uh, and, and he can't keep going. So I wonder, I wonder if, you have, if you have any thoughts about that sort of transition point between, okay, this is fine, and then I can't do it anymore. Thank you, Lia. It's a wonderful question. I think one thing that sometimes disappears from view, partly because, like I said, because it's such a cliched paratext for the Zapiski um, uh, Kavalerius Divitsi, what some, sometimes disappears from view is that Pushkin is not just corresponding with Durov Alexandrov. He's writing to the Durovs, right? So he's writing to both them and their brother. And at that point, Pushkin has an established relationship and an established opinion about Vasily Durov, which can also be found in Table Talk. So Table Talk, this collection of anecdotes that Pushkin puts together, has a little vignette about Vasily Durov, in which Pushkin discusses how Vasily Durov was this madman who always had these ideas of getting rich really fast through nefarious means, and also was famous for his weird sexual life. So Pushkin writes in Table Talk about how Vasily Durov um, having this official post in either Sarapolo or Yelabuga, they kind of moved around a lot, so I don't remember which one, um, kind of forced this peasant woman to be his mistress, and it was this really weird occasion, you know. So it's this exactly the kind of story that Pushkin really likes talking about, kind of a bawdy joke almost. So I think there is quite a lot of not just mystification, but kind of affection for body jokes that is integrated in there and that's why I like to draw attention to the kind of eroticized descriptions there which are typical for cross-dressing narratives so the scholar that I've quoted at least twice in my talk is Shreya Velasco who's the author of a book about Carolina de Rauso um, so the Spanish lieutenant nun right uh, whose story in terms of kind of its cultural reception in academia and cultural reception in the popular imagination has some striking parallels to Durov Alexandrov. Um, uh, partly because Karolina de Rauza has also left a literary narrative that can be read as well, as quite a lot of other kind of famous cross-dressing characters haven't really. Um, so I think there is this kind of bawdy joke thing that's going on, absolutely. And at some point, well, partly it's the flirtation's not going anywhere, right? <laughs> so Pushkin just gets really bored because this guy just keeps writing back to him saying, and then I became a man and so on and so forth. And Pushkin's just, what is going on? And I thought we were having a bit of kind of flirtatious fun. Um, and the, um, the Year of Life in St. Petersburg, I think is a really interesting text from that point of view. And I didn't want to focus on it too much because I've talked about it in a different occasions and I have an article coming out about it. Um, but it's very obviously shows the kind of, you know, even in that little bit that I've shared with you today, Pushkin just doesn't know what to do in this situation. So I think partly that moment of kind of this has to stop comes from him saying, well, like, this is a situation out of my experience and I don't kind of know what to do. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Hilda Hugenbaum. Hi, Margarita. Thank you so much. I, I think we've been waiting for you to present a 19V on Dorova, which has, as, I, as we can see from your work today, has, is a long ongoing project. And um, I, I wanted to know if you could address what is really kind of the big word in, in feminist queer studies these days, which is intersectionality. Uh, what are the what are the various vectors that you, you know, social cultural vectors that you see at play here? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and partly I'll have to restrain myself to not talk about um, kind of the various well-meaning misinterpretations of Durov Alexandrov's own texts because um, there is a seriously uh, questionable um, kind of ethnic 
sta e ethnically colored statements that they make in, in quite a lot of their less famous texts that have nonetheless been interpreted by quite a lot of scholarship in Russia as the sign of Durov Alexandrov's interest in kind of the local indigenous people's cultures, whereas in fact, when you read the text, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> so kind of there is the question of various social vectors and kind of various marginalized communities as described in their work and also in kind of those vectors in their own lives the two different things in terms of their own life i think there is something very interesting there in terms of um kind of the almost complete monopoly that feminist criticism had on um Durova alexandrov for quite a few years i think most of you here would be familiar with this text being featured quite a lot in lists of kind of first female biographies for example um in in russia and i think as i have said i think that's because that's the story that alexander tells us i don't think it's because people are consciously ignoring um, evidence it's because that's the story that alexander tells us but what's really interesting one of the really interesting things that i came across in the so there's as i've mentioned a few documents like kutches and latmanovs and one of them's very well known um to durova scholars is the first biography of durova alexander written um in the 1890s by um, nikrasova and that one has a very interesting passage in which that contempt, well, not exactly contemporary, but a 19th century person notes. And by the way, I'd like to point out that the difficulties that Durova has experienced in her life has nothing to do with the emerging woman's question. Um, and then Nikrasova goes on describing why. And I thought that was quite a very, you know, quite an interesting thing from a contemporary person. Um, it might be because they want to kind of de-problematize what's happening there, but or, or partly maybe that was really obvious to contemporaries, I don't know. But we do, there is this tradition of reading Durov Alexandrov's texts as a story of kind of female emancipation, right? So because Durova, Nadezhda Durova, couldn't live a free life as they wanted. Um, in Yelaboga is the daughter of a provincial civil servant. One of the ways in which decided, in which they've decided to liberate themselves was to join the army. And that was their way kind of to, to uh, combat the, um, the, the kind of the patriarchal uh, restrictions in which they had to live. And I think that's the story Alexandrov is telling us, which is way less problematic when, than what was actually happening to them. In terms of their um, kind of social background, um, it's <laughs> not, not too bad by 19th century Russian standards. Um, what was very interesting to me when I started researching their life and not just their work, which for me was, was a new thing, I'm, I'm mostly used to working with literary texts, is, I don't know how many of you know that, historians of army know that very well, but to me, and that's, maybe this is a, you know, this just shows you how naive I am, but being a hussar is really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of problems that Durov Alexandrov had um, in terms of money, you know, they were constantly writing to the various army quarters requesting more money and more money. And that's not because they lived in a modest lifestyle. It's because it's actually just really expensive being in the army. Um, and in that sense, kind of, you know, their social standing here doesn't mean anything. Yeah, of course, you know, they're from a good family. Their father and brother are kind of hereditary civil servants um, in, in the Ural region, but they still have no money. Um, and I think there was a question that I've spotted there about the son and the marriage, and that kind of comes into this as well. So Durov Alexandrov in real life were married to someone called Chernov and had a son. And again, that has kind of been well known since, well, not well known, as I said, you know, as, as far as liter as far as history goes, but it has been a known fact since the 1890s when Nikrasov, I think, was one of the very first ones to put it into a, into a biography. And then there is another note by Blinov, the person from that area who discovered the church records of marriage, right? And, and I think published them as well. So that's all came out in the 1890s. Um, and what we do know about the sun are various things from um, testimonials, and we also have records of Durova's father, who was taking care of their son uh, for quite a long time. Uh, various letters from the father, uh, so the grandfather of that of that boy, um, trying to get him into a into into a school, into a military school, and it's quite a sore point in Russian language scholarship because quite a lot of studies ask, how could she abandon her son 
what kind of woman is that? Was the fatherland more important? So you do have quite a lot of these passages where I just go, oh my God. Um, but you know, they're quite an important part of this Russian language academic discourse on, on Durova. Um, but the, the scholars in the local museums are also doing incredible work. You know, they've they've tracked down the descendants and now live in France. So you know, you can you can read that all on their website. I don't exactly remember what happened to the son, but the Durova. Alexandra line <laughs> has continued and there are still people there are still people living first of all margarita thanks that was exactly what i was hoping for it was wonderful and and so much of it is very familiar that the trans people have been fictionalizing their biographies forever editors have been fictionalizing trans people's biographies forever in order to make them more saleable and and move them away from the narrative that the trans person wanted to tell so it's it's all absolutely familiar stuff. Um, but actually the thing that caught my attention, and that is because my main interest is in science fiction and fantasy, was that Alexandrov has written a book called Werewolf, um, which firstly, it's, it's a fan fantasy or horror story. And secondly, it's about a creature that undergoes a transformation. So please tell me more about more about the werewolf book. Thank you. Um, excellent question. I'm glad you didn't ask about Gudishki because I couldn't finish that. That's a really long novel. <laughs> but, but because because Dora and Alexander are very, very obviously writing for money, quite a lot of what they're writing is cliches even by that time already. So when I say that they've had a very successful literary career, what I mean is everything they wrote was published, quite often it was commissioned and they were paid for it. The problem was that A, they were not paid enough to actually sustain this as a literary career, but a good point is that neither was Pushkin, right? So he was famously bankrupt by the time he died. Um, but also um, the reviews were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so the werewolf was one of those that I think got um, quite bad reviews in general, and that's because it's a kind of a cliched story that you would um, that you would expect. But my favorite actually is the Yarchuk, the ghost seeing dog, because it kind of tells you the story that it promises. It's about the dog that can see ghosts, um, and I think these are not translated into English, um, and there might be a question of whether. <laughs> They are actually worth the effort, to be honest. Um, but maybe, maybe they are, and um, maybe we need to uh, get on, get on with those translations. But I, I, the thing is that it's very difficult, and I'm kind of always against using aesthetical categories when we talk about literary fiction that's specifically produced for commercial purposes. But the contemporary reviews were terrible as well, so I wouldn't vouch for the werewolf. <laughs> So we have a question from uh, Lydia Leskovich. Uh, I'm really curious about the fate of Nadezhda Durova's marriage and family. Was Durova Alexandrov in touch with their son during and after their military service? And was Alexander Alexandrov considered legally a different person from Nadezhda Durova and therefore not married or not a parent? How did the contemporaries work it all out? Excellent question. Unfortunately, no. I think the contemporaries and contemporaries um, haven't worked it all out. And one of the things that became very obvious to me, because again, I'm not a legal historian, right? I'm a literary historian. So quite a lot of work that I've done on Dorova was completely on Dorova Alexandrov was completely new to me. Is that you know things are much less fixed in the beginning of the 19th century in Russia. So I think what was quite obvious to me is that one of the problems, so from Bigunova's um, archival um, records, for example, one of the things that was very obvious to me that one of the problems that the Russian military saw with providing documentation was that it wasn't clear to them whether they were providing documentation to legally the same person who did the service, right? So kind of after Durova Alexandrov's cover was blown by Pushkin's publications, it seemed to them, because I didn't show you all of the records, but there is discuss, there are discussions there about whether they actually legally can give this person the record of dismissal of someone who was legally a different person. And I think there is also a problem, the reason why they mention a husband there also is for legal reasons, right? Because husbands had quite a lot of legal authority over their wives documentation specifically, right? So for quite a lot of years, they held the passports, right? So the question there would be, even if we just accept that this is Nadia Durova, 
can we actually give her these documents or do we need to get her husband here so that we give these documents to him? So there is a lot of kind of a lot of confusion there. And this is why I think Bigonova's discoveries are absolutely priceless because we can kind of hear the voices of those people in little Russian Cancellaria thinking, oh my God, you know, how do I, how do I deal with this mess? Um, and um, in relation to their son, um, from what I understand, having read the most up-to-date biographies, we don't know much about their relationship, but we do know that towards the end of Durov Alexander's life, and they lived a very long and, to all, you know, to all appearances, fairly happy life, um, towards the end especially, um, that um, they would only consent to kind of have correspondence with their son if the son addressed them as Alexander Alexander. So they, you know, they wouldn't break off the relationship, but that relationship was, would, if it were to exist, would be based on an understanding that that is not a mother, right? So that, that, that little vignette is from one of the testimonials. So I, I can't remember if it's Kucho or Lashmanov, but they write about Durov Alexander for receiving a letter from their son, addressing them as Matushka, and then basically not replying. And then the same letter came, I think, asking for a blessing for marriage. And the same letter comes addressing um, it says Stabrot Mr. Alexandrov, and then Durov Alexandrov writes a reply. So it's quite an interesting thing, you know, it's not, it's not kind of the complete, um, it, it's not a complete denial of the existence of that son, but rather kind of trying to find a compromise, a compromise of, of two different gender identities there. And we have a question from Gillian Porter. Uh, which form of the author's name do you recommend for future publications, syllabi, and class discussions? Nurva Alexandrov, Nurva Alexandrov with a dash, with a slash, or perhaps simply Alexandrov? Thank you. Um, I think what, what this is a really difficult question because, of course, you know, on the one hand, I think if we were, if we were aiming to be absolutely historically respectful, I think it should be Alexandra, right? Because that's how this person calls themselves. On the other hand, because this is not some unknown person that we've suddenly uncovered in Russian history, but a well-established um, kind of subject of scholarly publications, I think that would kind of make it incredibly difficult for people to find anything, um, which is why I found this compromise for myself, which is Durova slash Alexandra. And to me, this seems um fair because it, on the one hand it pays respect to how a person would actually refer to themselves and at the same time acknowledges the long tradition of existence as a subject um and i'm sorry it's an object of academic of academic scholarship um of this mythological creature um Nadezhda Durova, that they have themselves created right for a purpose, perhaps to try and see in this literary narrative what a slightly less problematic existence of someone in their situation would, would have looked like. This is what it, um, it, it seems like to me. I mean, the beautiful readings that um, Irina Savkina has produced and lots of other scholars, some of whom I, I see here today, you know, those brilliant articles um, on Durov Alexandrov, and they tell us quite a lot about this kind of gender identity. Um, that they have manifested in their literary texts. I just hope that kind of going into the future, we can bring in the other contextualizing sources as well. And that kind of just paints us the whole, the whole picture. But I think discarding the name Durva completely would just be incredibly confusing <laughs> for future generations of scholars. And I also have to say that I've just applied for um, a pot of money from St. Andrews to have um, a website which would host quite a lot of these sources, so they should be available for teaching in Russian and English if I get that money. Um, because, like I said, they have been available since the end of the 19th century, so it's just a question of bringing them into our teaching and, and academic practices. Oh, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, actually, a lot of my question, Lydia then asked in her question about the family, which I was interested in, and the question of can you divorce or what happens. And my other piece to that, which is very related, is very practical, but just in society, do we know whether Alexandrov was welcomed into male spaces like the club or when you're at a social event and the men and the women separate? where 
they went and how others responded. Because I can imagine it's maybe similar with Pushkin when you're writing. Um, as Lily was saying, maybe it's it's easier to play along with sort of we're into this idea of a mystification. But then when you're in a concrete situation, you've got kind of physical bodies in the room, like where they go. Um, I was curious about that. Oh, thank you. That's an excellent question. I thought you were going to ask about dancing because that's the most interesting thing as well. So um, it's difficult. Did you say they don't dance? I thought that was already answered. No, no, they do. Oh, this is the thing. Then I'll add that to the question. I misunderstood. <laughs> So this is the thing, I think there is no one answer to this because things change. And again, how do we know? How do I know about these things? How do we know about these things? So a year of life is in, a year of life in St. Petersburg is one account that tells you quite a lot. It's basically specifically um, about Dora Alexandrov's experience of queer celebrity. What does it mean to be a celebrity in 19th century St. Petersburg if you're famous for kind of operating outside of kind of crossing gender barriers. How does it work? And that's exactly what they describe, kind of how they come to parties and then what happens. And it seems that, so that particular question is not answered. Like, I don't know if they were let into like the billiards room or whatever, uh, because quite a lot of this narrative is about how they're slighted because <laughs> they feel slighted because they're not given enough attention. But um, mm -hmm. dancing comes up um, and the protagonist in that novella says, well, obviously I couldn't dance because, you know, I'd have to dance with the ladies, but they wouldn't dance with me. So that comes up. But in the later accounts, for example, like those two that I shared today, we do have um, we do have notes about them being invited into male spaces. Um, and in particular, the governor of Yulabuga, where they lived, would, in what, would invite them to kind of the, the this evenings where the creme de la creme of the of the town would be invited and one of my favorite stories is actually something that also like again i'd really like to emphasize these are not my archival discoveries right so these are very well known to um, to biographers um there is a record by i think it's a niece of shishkin the um the painter you know the the famous russian painter the the three bears um who lived in yulabuga and she said she says in those in the in her memoirs that um um durov alexandrov durov alexandrov was invited everywhere with other other men and really liked to dance with young ladies for example one of my nieces so clearly in yulabuga that was a slightly different story because durov alexandrov lived there for you know decades um, and according to those testimonials, everyone knew that. So no one thought that, you know, everyone knew who they were. So they knew that that was Nadezhda Durova, the daughter of Durov the Garadnici, who now lives as Alexander Alexandrov. So I just think it, it paints a, a pretty good picture of uh, <laughs> provincial Russia of that particular period, which to me was a little bit surprising. Thank you. We have a question from Ali Ackroyd. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Wanted to ask about the Soviet era, era existing scholarship on Durova. To what extent would you say they were described as opposing the old regime, an approach quite popular at the time amid Soviet historians, thinking, for example, how Oscar Wilde was described by them? Um, so my source here would be the kind of the kind of work that has been published by Ilana Prikashko, for example, in which she has in one of her biographies, she has a big chapter where she kind of just um, very, very coherently answers that question. Um, and what's really interesting is that by the beginning of the 20th century, um, there were a lot of encyclopedia and dictionary entries for Durov Alexandrov. So there was this feeling that kind of and because there were so many things published in the 1890s, so after the revolution, I get from Prikashko's account and from my own um, acquaintance with this, with the Soviet era sources, there was this shared feeling that, you know, the research is done, right? So we know everything we need to know about this person at this stage, which is why, you know, it took almost 90, 90 years for new, um, for new materials to, to be discovered by Bigunova. Um, and it was more kind of the period of multiple adaptations rather than scholarship. So a lot of new scholarship on um, Durova Alexandrov is post-Soviet, 
So the um, Soviet period, I would say, is kind of the era of entrance of Durov Alexandrov into popular cultural imagination. In fact, I think Mary Zierin, in her translator's introduction to the notes of the Cavalry Maiden, um, has a very good list of Soviet adaptations. And in fact, I know that there might be some people in the audience who know about the circumstances of her work. I'm just incredibly impressed with the level of detail. I have no idea how she got um, the details of kind of the, the very small adaptations like the, the flying carpet stories that were published in the regional publishing house. So it's an incredibly impressive list, um, which I have to say is much more um, detailed than the post-Soviet scholarship um, of adaptations as well. Um, so I would say the Soviet period is the period of adaptations and reception in popular culture rather than um, scholarship um, itself. Okay, and we have a question from Natasha Barbash. I did not quite get whether Durova was married and had a son before enlisting in cavalry in real life or whether that happened to a character in the notes. If the son really existed, what happened to him in later life? I think I have answered that for the... For the I think so part. too, but I, I put it out there just in case. Okay, yeah, great. So but, yeah, you know, you can email me and if there's anything else, I'm, I'm happy to share um, references and... Um, okay. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Natalia, uh, Nat Natalia Barisova. Uh, I'm sorry I was uh, I was late and heard only the last part of your talk. I would like to ask whether you can, one, uh, connect Durva to other uh, woman warriors in the Napoleonic Wars, two, in the context of the rise of nationalism in Europe, women warriors were some kind of a myth and very popular persons, like Emilia Plater later in uh, Potter in Poland. So probably it was easier for contemporaries to accept the queerness of Durva in that context. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, so just to, to answer about Emilia Platter straight away. So Nikrasova's biography actually talks about Emilia Platter in one of its first lines, which is quite fascinating. So that's the 18, 1890s, what is considered by Durva, Durva Alexandrov scholars, the first biography, really. Um, and it talks about it's a very weird reference. So um, Nikrasova calls her Stare Plater. And I had a really difficult time trying to figure out who she was talking about because Emilia Plater famously died, I think, in her early 20s. I thought, who, wh what is this? Um, but there is clearly, you know, the, the contemporaries were making these connections for sure. Um, but what I think is really interesting in terms of connecting Durova to other women warriors in the Baronic Wars is first that I think. <laughs> We're not talking about a woman warrior here in the first place. I think we're talking about someone who um, um, is choosing the army as one of the ways in which to kind of actualize their lived gender identity of perhaps not a woman. Um, and what I'm interested in is the context of other people in that situation who've left accounts of their life uh, because the number of those is significantly smaller. And so in that sense, I quite like talking and in, so this is a part of my larger project, which is uh, my um, second monograph on kind of the cultural history of cross-dressing um, in the Russian empire and the kind of characters and the kind of historical figures that I compare Durov Alexandrov to are Katerina de Arauzo that I have already mentioned. There is also a Hungarian person, Shandor um, Bey, who's, um, who's been fairly well known in Hungarian scholarship. Um, so it's kind of specifically not just women who went to war, but specifically people who left literary or autobiographical accounts of their experience crossing the kind of the gender boundaries. And in terms of the context of the rise of nationalism in Europe, yeah, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. This is how the contemporaries saw Durov Alexandrov. And this is definitely how the, um, partly the reason for how the situation has been managed by the Russian army, right? So they're not dealing with something that's completely out of the ordinary. These things are fairly, fairly well known. And in fact, the series of commemorative notes, not that commemorative coins should tell us anything about the real historical narrative of Russian history, but in terms of how these things are perceived, Vasilina Kozhinova, I think, um, I never know how to pronounce um, 19th century 
19th century names, who is the other kind of the partisan female character, partisan female hero of the War of the 1812, is on the contemporary 2012 coin as well. So there is definitely some grouping that's happening in at least public history um, of Durov Alexandrov um, with, these, with these people. Um, and in terms of kind of accepting the queerness, I think the accounts that I've shared, and if you're interested, I would really encourage you just type in Ruska Sterina, it's all digitized, it will come out, out even without the um, library catalogs. Um, I think they tell exactly kind of what contemporaries thought and how they dealt with the, um, what we would now call the queerness of Durov Alexandrov's um, gender presentation. But thank you, great, great question. Great. Um, uh, hi, I have a kind of comment, a small comment and also a question. And as I was raised uh, in Soviet Union, and of course this, this um, story was presented as, as an example of women in emancipation, that what they had to uh, dress like men, they have to tell they, they men, but actually now women could do whatever they want, dress like they want. And, um, and uh, I did not know that it actually was much, much deeper for uh, this person. And, <clears throat> but what I would like to say, maybe what you asked, um, you said that you don't understand why uh, contemporary scholars uh, said uh, saying about her like she, why she or uh, he abandoned um, abandoned uh, uh, their son and in uh, probably here it's also I was uh, um, I lived in um, also provincial town 100 kilometers from Moscow and um, actually homosexuality especially among women was very accepted, but not officially accepted, after, especially after World War II, because a lot of women start, they lost their husbands and start to live together and raise one's child or two children. So for them, it was like, why? Why she abandoned, she could like do this. But my question about, not about her, but about Chernov, her husband, why he decided to do this if it was absolutely known that she has this uh, identity and what who he was why she probably it's how it's actually this uh, marriage was arranged and uh, for what reason and what actually why he did it not do <laughs> Durov Alexander, but Chernov, your husband. All oh, right, thank you. Um, I think um, I'm I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to say that um, there, there are biographical accounts. So I would really recommend Diana Prikashkova's book, and she talks about all the biographical information that we have on Chernov. Um, and one other thing that not just Prikashkova but other biographies kind of share an understanding as well that Durov Alexandrov's short novella. Yelena Krasavitsa Tskaya is actually based on the circumstances of her own marriage. So we don't know for sure, but it is considered that that is possibly the story of her marriage. So if you're interested in, in kind of the details of that, I would really recommend Prikashik of a study, uh, which is very thorough um, on that and has a really good bibliography or, or and reading that short story that perhaps as scholars think tells the story of, of Durov Alexandrov's own marriage. Okay, and we had a question from Anne Lounsbury, and you can go ahead. Yes, this kind of goes back to what Ilya said at the beginning of the discussion, because I too was struck by the fact that Bushkin seemed to, in their correspondence, think that they were sort of in a Povisi Belkina mode, playing with layers of irony and representation, that they were doing a sort of, what is it, Barishnev Kirisyanku, kind of playing with identities, and then when um, when they met in person, he got confused that, that it was something else. But that made me wonder whether um, the particular historical and literary historical moment when Dorva Alexandrov was doing this made certain, um, certain strategies available to them 
right? That wouldn't have been available in other moments. Like what if this had been going on in, um, in the moment of high realism, say, when you, when, when you were expected, when writers were expected to have a less problematic, generally, relationship with the narrator, right? When there was supposed to be a sort of generally, say, quote, sincere or straightforward relationship between the narrator and, and the writer. Um, and it, it's just hard to imagine it evolving in the same way. So I just think that it's fascinating that the particular literary historical moment um, possibly, you know, uh, kind of affected how how this this took shape, or made it made made it possible for them to um, enact enact this gender identity, who in a way that maybe would not have been the same in another time and place. Mm, absolutely, I, I I I agree with you absolutely there, Anne. Thank you, um, and which is why I think that trans narratology is a really useful tool there, right? Because it doesn't just look at the familiar to us relationships between narrator and protagonist and um, implied author and things like that. It looks at it specifically in the context of either narratives composed by people who have some experience of transition or attempted transition, or um, people who are writing about that process specifically. And um, I was recently at a very good conference where I've met Cheryl, for example, we both have been there um, at this great symposium on trans narratology, kind of an emerging discipline. And it's very obvious that lots of people are working with contemporary texts, as, as quite often happens with narratology. So I think it's also quite important to bring in um, earlier texts into that and texts from outside of the um, kind of anglophone canon. Um, and um, I think that can help, you know, as a tool that can help us talk about these um, these distinctions, for sure. I just wanted to say thank you because this make this this has always been a fascinating text, obviously, but your talk makes it vastly more interesting to me and makes it much more likely that I will teach it again. And just it it opens it up in so many ways and um, helps me to see the text in in just ways that I absolutely haven't at all. It's not just you know, cross-dressing um, or the woman question or something like that. So really, thank you very much for this work. Um, and also, I want to thank you for uh, so so consistently acknowledging all the scholarship that you're drawing on. Um, I really appreciate that, too. It, this, this is such a wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you.